Tempo has been a process where we bring together climate scientists, social scientists, and musicians to look at what can be done, why we aren't doing it, and how we can use music to change that outcome. So I want to start with a panel here where I'm going to ask for three people to talk a bit about some of these issues to lay the groundwork of it. So Paul Slovic is a professor of psychology at the University of Oregon. He should be joining us virtually, and we'll be getting the presentation with him. Uh, but I don't see the Zoom up yet. Oh, there we go. So uh, Paul, if we could ask you to start. Uh, thank you, uh, Lucy. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to give you a much too quick uh, introduction to some of the psychological science that motivates the, uh, the session that we're having today. May I have the first slide, please? First slide. Uh, behavioral research, has, can you see it? Uh, uh, yes, fine. Okay. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of uh, behavioral research that has identified psychological obstacles that are blocking uh, action to protect the climate. I mean, basically, the problem is that we are, we are uh, failing to respond adequately to the, to the scientific basis that uh, shows us the importance of the problem. Uh, we're just, uh, for decades, we have uh, neglected to act properly. So what we know with regard to the behavior is, and meaning is that emotion is critical because it conveys meaning upon information, and that sparks action. And without emotion, information lacks meaning and may not influence decision-making and behavior. So uh, scientific data and statistics uh, often lack the emotional meaning needed to motivate action, unless you're a scientist and you, you do uh, uh, have that uh, emotional reaction. Most of us uh, have trouble with the data. So as a result, most people don't understand the reality of climate change and don't respond appropriately to information and warnings from scientists. Next slide, please. So research shows that we think in uh, two ways, uh, fast, intuitive uh, mode of thinking and a slower analytic way of thinking. Next slide, please. So uh, here's what it looks like, these two modes of thinking. The fast uh, mode, we often call it experiential thinking. It's intuitive. It responds strongly to, to uh, images you know, visual images, sounds, the stories, and it creates instant feelings with us, which is sometimes use the jargon word affect to, you know, describe what we mean by a feeling. And it's often non-conscious. We're not even aware of how we're, that we're thinking this way. The slow way is what, uh, you know, what we're taught to, as scientists or as lawyers or as, uh, you know, uh, other uh, uh, analytic uh, uh, disciplines. It's, uh, it's, uh, deliberative, it uses logic and reasons and numbers and mathematics, and we're very conscious uh, when, we're, when we're doing this. Next slide, please. So this fast thinking, relying on our feelings, is our de default mode of, of thought as we go through the, the day. We make a lot of judgments and decisions uh, every day, and, and we're not going around with a calculator, you know, uh, uh, doing a, a numerical analysis to decide you know, what time, whether we should have, uh, have lunch or continue working on a, on a paper that's due that, uh, in the afternoon. So fast thinking, uh, we rely on it because it's easy, it feels right, it usually works for us, uh, except when it doesn't, because it is innumerate and thus can lead to serious mistakes when numbers are involved and the scale of the impacts is large. Next slide. So what do I mean when I say feelings are innumerate? Well, they don't, our feelings don't add or multiply. They don't scale up. We have a saying based on research that demonstrates this, that the more who die, the less we care. Kind of a shocking uh, assessment. Thus, we underreact to catastrophic threats to people and the planet, of which climate change is a good example of this underreaction. And what we call uh, this arithmetic of compassion is a flawed and deadly arithmetic. It doesn't operate the way other arithmetic does. So let's uh, briefly look at this in the context of valuing the protection of lives. As the number of lives increases, uh, how, do we, how do we value the protection when we're using fast thinking based on our feelings? 
So the, the figure on the left shows a, 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 a valuation where the very first life is most important. Notice the jump uh, from zero to one. Two uh, doesn't seem twice as important, uh, two lives to protect as one. And then as you get higher and higher, the curve levels off and we don't notice the difference. Uh, start no we become insensitive you know, uh, very quickly between uh, five lives, six lives in terms of our feelings. It's even worse this, than this. Sometimes when the numbers are very large, not only do we become insensitive, we lose feelings altogether. So you see on the right, you see what we call a collapse model where uh, when the numbers are really big, they're just numbers and we, they don't convey any feeling uh, in us. Uh, next slide. So numerical data and statistics of major threats such as climate change do not move us to act. The emotion needed to spark attention, meaning, and action is created more effectively by experiential information, such as stories, images, and music, than by numerical data and statistics. Uh, an example, next slide. So uh, the Syrian war started in 2011. By September 2015, 250,000 people had died and millions had fled as refugees. There was remarkably little interest from the outside world. Uh, and this changed overnight in September 2015. Next slide. When we saw it, when the world uh, was shown this picture of a little boy uh, on the beach, uh, his, uh, his uh, family was es escaping Syria, the boat capsized, the, uh, the boy drowned and was washed up on the beach. It went viral overnight. Uh, next slide. And here's, uh, here's the, the data. Prior to that image, 250,000, statistics of 250,000, Yes, didn't interest people in searching uh, for refugees or Syria until you see that image appear. You see the spike. Uh, next slide. Another uh, indicator of, of response is the donations to, the, to places like the Red Cross on behalf of you know, taking care of refugees. And you see that prior to that image, it was relatively low. And then it went up 50-fold overnight when that image uh, uh, was um, was experienced by people. Next slide, please. So uh, this has a lot of implications for communicating climate science with data. Uh, we need to make scientific, scientific data experiential to create emotional meaning for non-scientists. Uh, images work, as we, as we just saw an example. So for example, show people what their home or favorite resort near the ocean would look like under various levels of projected sea rise um, uh, protected rise in sea level, rather than simply giving them the numbers. Next slide, please. So um, we see that images can uh, create experiential meaning, and as we shall see uh, in this session, uh, music can do the same. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. So if we need to make our data experiential, we are scientists, we don't want to throw the data out. What are the ways in which we can be doing that? And then uh, we've asked uh, environmental engineer Ryan Ward from Caltech to talk for a minute about ways in which the climate data can be uh, used to do this. Yeah, thank you for having me, Lucy. Is this to do this? Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you. So I guess I have sort of the easiest job because I'm just a scientist and I get to tell other scientists that data is important. And so thanks, <laughs> thanks to Lucy, I guess, for uh, giving me this, um, this role. And I think a lot of us think a lot of the data that we collect is quite objective. Um, you know, when we're in the lab or we're out in the field, we're collecting data and we just think, okay, the data is the data. These are the results of the experiments we run. Uh, but then we rewrite our papers and we submit them, we get our reviews back and the reviews we have, reviewers screaming at us or disparaging us or someone tweets about a paper and maybe they're making a funny comment or a sack or whatever it is, right? We see that the narratives that we write with our data are not objective. These are now subjective. And so the, the question I want to pose is whether or not data itself can be emotional and what types of emotion do they evoke and can we control that emotional response? So I just want to use a simple case study. I think a lot of us have seen this plot before. Uh, this is the Keeling curve. Uh, it started by Charles David Keeling, the late 50s at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. It's just a measurement of the nominal CO2 concentration in our atmosphere. So you can see time on the x-axis, years before present, and on the y-axis we just have the CO2 concentration. And we, many of us know this, we're quite intimately familiar with this plot. We see CO2 is rising. So we all know that greenhouse gases are contributing to climate change. They're sort of the 
penultimate, or sorry, excuse me, like the ultimate, like, you know, contributor, right, for the greenhouse effect. So the, the question is, is this plot, like, the most representative, the most evocative, or the primary conveyor of, like, an urgent need for climate action? And I would argue that probably it's not. It's just like a straight line and some wiggles for like the interannual variability, right? It's not like the most urgent plot. And so would we argue that CO2 concentrations themselves are inherently lacking any urgency to them in that type of data? And then I would push back on that and I would say, no, it's not that this data itself lack the urgency. It's just that the way that we present it probably lacks some urgency. And so what I'm doing this time is taking just a plot of CO2 concentration, but all I'm doing is extending the x-axis back. And I make it sound pretty simple, but I'm sure, you know, a lot of work went into collecting all this data, surely. So now we have a, a million years on the x-axis instead of the, you know, 70 or so years of the Keeling curve. And what we see is that CO2, you know, its concentration, it oscillates. It goes up and down, and it has some natural variability to do it. And I annotated where humans come into the picture, and where we start putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, and we see this massive spike that's quite abnormal looking. And so I would argue that this plot, it's still just the same, it's just the same data, right? We haven't done too much, but we've told the story just a little bit differently. We've extended time, and now I think there's a lot more urgency in this plot than in the one before it. It's just the same data, but the emotional response of that data can actually be quite different. But this is all to say that, you know, I'm communicating to scientists and engineers. Many of us already know this data. And so, you know, obviously we see the urgency perhaps in, the, in this plot. And so when we're communicating, you know, we have to understand that uh, it's all contextual. And so I have two tweets on here. I, I pulled one from the Keeling curve. Um, we all know recently that, of course, at Mauna Loa, the, perhaps the best site for CO2 measurements is an active volcano right now. And so the measurement had to shut down, of course. And so the, the official Twitter account tweeted, and they got 100 retweets and 100 likes. Um, and so if, if we think that this is the most important measurement to understand climate change, you know, maybe there should be a little bit more urgency on Twitter. And then the other picture I have is, I don't know, expert witness Paul, whoever he is, um, has a picture of the volcano actually erupting, right? And that has 12,000 likes and 3,000 retweets. So and it's just as uh, the other Paul has said, right, that, you know, images, music, art, written language, you know, we have to understand who exactly we're trying to communicate to. If it's just to scientists and engineers, then, you know, perhaps the, the tweet on the left, you know, would be sufficient. But obviously, you know, there's a more emotional response that we can get from these different mediums. And so... That's all. Thanks. <laughs> and now let's ask Makiko. I didn't properly introduce you when you started playing. Makiko Harada has got 10 uh, recordings. You, you heard what a pianist she is. She's also been working with neuroscientists to be studying how music interacts with our bodies. So Makiko. Thank you, Lucy. So it's interesting, actually, because both Ryan and Paul said the importance of storytelling and music and all this, but what they showed were images, images of Island, the three-year-old lying on the beach, and also the Twitter pictures, right? And so what we are proposing here, I think, with Tempo is, you know, the society today is so visual-centered, visual-oriented, but actually, so uh, let me tell you, we, our brain processes visions 20 to 100 times slower than we do sound. And that's because when the image hits our eyes, it goes through the prefrontal cortex, which is a part of our brain that deals with things like logic, reason, self-control, right? So it takes time, and it, it thinks about the image, but hearing the sound, as soon as it hits our eardrums, it takes much less time. That's because it skips the prefrontal cortex and goes to the most primitive part of our brain called amygdala that has to do with things like emotions and instincts. Sound is most closely tied to our survival mechanism, survival instincts, because it's the sense that's most likely to detect threats, right? Our vision can only see things that right in front of us if nothing is blocking it, right? But sound penetrates most things, and it's a surround sound. We can hear anything. And we close our eyes. We can avert our eyes from things that we don't want to see. But our ears are open even when we are asleep. That's why we use alarm clocks, right? <laughs> and that's why we jump when there is a sudden explosive sound without us really actually consciously thinking about what the sound source is. And so we're proposing 
that, you know, we need a climate anthem that everybody can sing together. Everybody can synchronize their voices, their heartbeats, their, their breathing and brainwaves together to reassure us that, you know, we do need to cohabitate, to cooperate, to commiserate, to face our challenges together. And we're also proposing to you, the scientists, that you know you visualize your data so beautifully, but how about a sonification of your data? Uh, and uh, I can say to Makiko, I thought about that. I heard this data, all of this information about auditory data as a scientist, and I saw maybe many of you saw this, about a decade ago, a cellist took the climate data and turned it into pitch. And so when it's a low note, it's, uh, it's cold, and when it's a high note, it's, it's hot. And I was I, studying a type of music where there was something called a contus firmus. And so I ended up writing a piece of music that you're going to be hearing that takes that climate data. In this rendition of it, it's going to be played on the saxophone. Thank you, Richard. And, uh, and then but try to create music around it.
we have a second panel, if you guys, uh, to, but now this one's going to be completely virtual. None of the psychologists were going to be joining us uh, in person here. So uh, we're bringing back Paul Slovic, the professor of psychology from the University of Oregon. We also have Sarah Dryhurst, who is a uh, researcher with the uh, at University College London. Did I get this correct? Uh, yeah in psychology and especially around climate change. And Emiliano rodriguez Nush, who is a uh, risk communication professional working with the World Bank and the UN in uh, over 30 different countries. So here, we're going to, rather than being presentations, I really want to be trying to encourage um, my three panelists to help us understand. We've just heard that emotions are what matter. Looking at the data tends to give us emotions of somberness and anticipation and sometimes fear. Uh, and we need to talk about what are the ones that are likely to lead to action. So um, Paul, let's start with you and just what does fear do for us? Fear, fear helps us survive in the face of uh, the dangers that uh, surround us and have surrounded us since since our, our earliest existence. And so we have uh, mechanisms in our brain that, uh, that helped us survive when we lived in caves. And these, these same processes uh, are, you know, still in our brains, but now they, they interact with another way that we've, we've uh, are evolved to be able to think, which is the slow uh, analytic scientific way of looking at things. So we've got what we call kind of a, a dance going on in our head between feelings and analysis, kind of going back and forth. And so uh, uh, fear is one of those, uh, those feelings that leads to fast response and you know, uh, escape from, from danger. So it's, it's obviously it's, it's, uh, it's essential to, uh, to survival and of course, uh, it can lead us astray too when we are when we overreact to things that we shouldn't worry so much about. Sarah, uh, let's try and get a discussion going rather than me directly being uh, questioning things. But I think that we want to look at the uh, the balance between fear and what we do with fear when it feels like there's nothing we can do about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I'd echo what, what, what Paul was saying, really. I think that our fear response is a very ancestral response. It's a fight and flight, fight or flight. Um, but it, it, it's, it's good for short, quick, quick responses to things. But for the longer term action that we might need when it comes to climate, our fear response isn't going to be enough. In fact, we can't physiologically sustain uh, a, a level of fear for for that for that long period of time that might be might be necessary. And in fact, you know, we we've seen um, that too much fear can actually be demotivating. It can give people a sense of of fatalism, really. So, as much as we we need to feel a sense of of, of threat in order to act when it comes to a risk we also need other things to 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 go alongside that we need to feel crucially this sense of hope i think that's a really key emotion that we've discussed quite a lot in in tempo um this idea that we we can make a difference and we can feel hope that we can do that and i think music is a real gateway to the kind of experience of hope those feelings um especially because it's so collective um, and participatory it can give us that collective sense of we can do something um together so yeah that's just you know my initial thoughts off the back of what what paul had been saying well, perhaps i could i could uh, uh add to that with regards to the important uh concept of efficacy that sarah just raised and um it's interesting because efficacy is a feeling and what we've learned is that that if sometimes we we think about what we can't do that sends a bad feeling into our brain that demotivates us from feeling good about what we can do so we have to recognize that and and work to to overcome that uh, 
and, and realize that even if we can't fix the whole problem, uh, we should still uh, do, do what we can because everything is important. And we need then also to learn how to make our, our actions more effective, more efficacious. And that can be done by joining others in a, in a movement, you know, activist groups and other ways. So it, when we understand kind of the way our minds work, that helps us uh, do things that can overcome the limitations that, have, uh, that lead us falsely to be too passive. Emiliano has been working with the World Bank and the UN in different countries in disaster awareness and uh, creating, you know, working with a, some sort of, I'm not sure who he is, a music star in Mexico for earthquake awareness, a notable young singer in Haiti on hurricane preparedness, and then tsunami awareness in, in bringing together women from Chile and, and Japan to share their experiences. And in all of these situations, many with the use of music, it's about getting pride in what they're doing. And that's one of the ones I sort of want to hit back to, to Sarah and Paul about what pride can give us uh, in feeling as part of a community and how the role of community in directing action. Either one? Go ahead, sir. I was just, um, oh, it looks like we've got Emiliano back, so I'll just, just say something quickly and then I can, I can hand over to, to him because he's obviously the expert on this. But uh, my sense, at least when it comes to having a sense of pride about one's environment, one's community, the people around oneself, is that we, I mean, when we think of the, the psychology of things, we, we're terrified of loss and we, we, the things that we fear losing most are the things that we value the most and, 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 and take pride in. So one thing for me, and, and Emiliano might want to come in on this or maybe, maybe feels differently, but I think a sense of pride and, uh, in, in one's environment can mean that one uh, is, is inspired perhaps to feel more protective of it and want to take action to maintain it the, the way it is, protect it and, and, and maintain that, that sense of sense of belonging to avoid the loss that we, 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 all, we all fear. But Emiliano, I'll hand over yeah. to you. I, I did introduce your slides because we lost you for a bit, but uh, so you can just talk about them. Yes. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm having some connectivity issues, but uh, I really wanted to share some quick stories of some risk communications campaigns that we did in different countries trying to engage communities in the process and trying to turn these negative emotions like fear, anxiety, you mentioned somberness, into positive emotions that lead, lead to action. And of course, one of them is pride. Um, there's a three pictures that I brought, uh, which I consider good examples because pride in, in, in these campaigns proved to be very effective to cre help create a sense of agency or responsibility and also self-efficacy to engage others in the conversations about natural hazards because when you feel proud um, you want to you feel like sharing it so people pay attention so i brought a few pictures of recent projects in mexico haiti japan and chile and these are the people that we work with um, so uh one of the um, one of the stories is um about um chefs and restaurant owners from chile and japan that get together um, to tell the stories of how they survived tsunamis. And together, they, they cook together, and you can see in that picture how they brought their own ingredients, how, how proud they are to be to share their stories, to share their learnings, and uh, to be community leaders who led the recovery of their communities. And, and of course, in another campaigns, we got to use music. In one of them, we work with Haitian singers and musicians to alert millions of people about hurricane season in Haiti. You could see how they felt so proud to become um, ambassadors, environmental ambassadors in their own country, to be leaders of uh, prompting people to action uh, when it comes to preparing, getting prepared for hurricane season. And the, the, the last example that I had working in Mexico is working with kids who composed a song with a Mexican rapper to teach it other kids to react responsibly when these seismic alert sounds and the seismic alarm sounds in Mexico. Uh, and I, I also could see how proud they were to take the lead to, to produce a song, the video, to share this important information for other kids to, to learn about it and not to feel, feel fear. 
And only three weeks about that video production, there was an earthquake in Mexico, and the kids evacuated when the alarm, seismic alarm sound, the whole school in 40 seconds. So we could see how that pride turned into action just three weeks after they did the video. So I could say that in, in those three, three different cultures, it was such a shortcut, I would say, to engage um, communities and for them to pay attention and to improve preparedness, which is something that involves lots of different actions. No, uh, I think one thing we can all understand in terms of the role of music, we think about watching a movie. What, why do movies have uh, background music in them? I mean, you can look at the screen and see the visual uh, images that are going on and, and hear the words and know the story, but the music amplifies and deepens the meaning of what we're experiencing uh, uh, visually. So I think that, that is a, a, a familiar uh, thing that we recognize about the power of music. Okay, thank you. Um, and that, Paul gave me the perfect lead into the, to the next section, actually. So we've been hearing, this has been what we're doing within Tempo, is having these discussions, why the motions matter, how do we connect it to the physical reality? Because we, are, we have to have hope. We have to believe that things, this makes a difference, right? We need to uh, avoid talking too much about loss, because we all hate losing things. If it's too much loss, we'll give it up. Uh, and we need a sense of community so that we feel like we belong within this. So we've got actual music composed and we're gonna be sharing it with you. I'm gonna ask Jonathan Beard and Manita Gandhi to come up here a minute. They have been part of the Tempo Project. And as Paul said, think about those films and how you need music in it. Well, Jonathan is a composer of films, orchestrator, uh, worked on a variety of genre, just got his first Emmy. And uh, Manita Gandhi is an a award-winning playwright, critically acclaimed painwright, who has also been working with Jonathan for the lyricist here. Now introduce their piece. Hello, thank you everyone. So I'm Jonathan Beard, a composer who has lived the experience of the communicative power of music. Hi, I'm Manita Gandhi, and I'm an artist who believes that we don't take anything with us, we just leave what we give. And when Jonathan first approached me, uh, approached me about working with the Tempo Project, I knew I had to say yes because it was an opportunity to work with first an artist whose work I so deeply admire, and secondly, a true opportunity to honor all of you and the work that you are doing and explore what is universal, even though all of your disciplines are so specific. And really arrived at a place of, with all of your work and research and data, it affords us the opportunity to create and inspire positive change. So the piece that you are about to hear, Rising Tide, was specifically composed to celebrate and honor the persistent growth of climate activism around the world. Um, there is much work to be done and there is much to celebrate. And we believe that both of those are possible at the same time. And a reminder of the QR code and the emotional uh, response that you have. Revolution, unifying the hope in our hearts. We come together, rising tide, unshakable spark. The revolution, seasons of compassionate change. Manifest creation, celebrate the actions of love. Mother Revolution When we come together When we come together Mother Revolution Unify the hope in our heart When we come together Rising tide, unshakable spark Be 
So now we're moving into the part, oh, well, look at that, hope, right in the center of it. Um, we're talking really now more about the music, and I want to have one more panel where we're going to ask the musicians who are here with us to come up and join us on stage and help talk about what musicians can do within this process. So uh, Jonathan Beard, who you've already heard from, and Makiko Harada, who you heard from, we will also be having Sean Kirchner, who's coming up with the guitar. Hmm. Uh, uh, another composer who's been working with us, and his piece will be the, the end of this program. And then our two conductors, Kirsten uh, Hedegaard, who is from the Chicago, let's see, Loyola University of Chicago, as well as the lead of the Eco Voice Project, and Tom Zelli, a uh, professor of music at North Park University, who's uh, uh, orchestra has been playing for us. So these are all musicians who've been involved, been talking to scientists, as weird as we are. And uh, <laughs> uh, I really, this is a pretty open-ended place where I want you guys to talk about how you see both musicians in the climate crisis, but also in the interaction with the various physical and social scientists. Um, do one of you want to start? And I think, you know, Makiko and Sean and, and Jonathan have been part of the Tempo Project from the beginning, uh, trying to help us scientists see things from a slightly broader point of view. So, uh, Jonathan, how did you get started in this? And then we can have others respond to it. Sure. Well, as Dr. Jones alluded to briefly in the earlier introduction, my background is largely in music for media. So I do a lot of work in film and television and video games, which all of those mediums are mediums of storytelling. And so the, 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 the power, the communicative power of music is something that I'm quite conscious about. And uh, plenty of music tells stories. Some music does not. That's not the process for all composers. It is definitely the process uh, that I live in. Uh, a lot. And so the, the sort of possibilities of bringing data, 
sort of hard, hard science and soft science together through the, the kind of lens of storytelling and having that lens be delivered through music is something that fascinates me and the possibilities for it fascinate me. So as Dr. Slovic alluded to in the previous panel, uh, the power of music to deepen understanding of uh, surface stories is vast. And it is one reason why it is used so much in media. It can create an additional, uh, an additional direct uh, communication that bypasses other parts of the brain, as Dr. Hirata talked about earlier. This power is, uh, is I think, crucial to tap, and hopefully musicians can be available to help uh, in, in that delivery uh, throughout moving forward. Pick up, guys. Who wants to respond to that? Well, one thing I've been interested in in terms of music's power is the concept of something going viral. Um, and what is that magical thing? And I think one of the things we hope for in tempo is that we can spur on the creation of new songs, new things, new TikToks. We don't actually care. Anything is good that gets masses of people motivated that haven't been motivated before. And so it's, there's a big question mark of what is the magic, but we just try to find it. But, but music very often is part of viral things. So um, speaking of the power of music, I, there is a story I like to tell. One time I was playing a concert and the piece ended very bravura, very big. And this gentleman in the front seat got up and he went bravo. And then he fell because he forgot that he needed a cane to stand. <laughs> <laughs> and we know we are facing an ex existential threat here with the climate crisis, but we've always been individually facing an existential threat with our mortality, right? But if there is something as powerful as music that can transport us from the mindset of worrying about our own existential threat and then think about others to, to, to join in this power of music or the wonders of the world or, and yeah, and you know, the other reason why I am so happy to be joining Tempo is that, so what, at one point in my life, I was touring. So every night concert, every day on the bus, you know, different cities, sort of the same whole playing pieces. And I see this power of music, but it's very fleeting and it's like deja vu every day and it's very disconnected. And you know, a lot of musicians talk about feeling marginalized, feeling voiceless, feeling very isolated. Um, and that's so strange. And then I've discovered, being married to a scientist now, the scientists sort of feel the same way. <laughs> and now, now I feel like now is the time where people like the musicians and the scientists can come together and join forces so that we won't be as isolated and we can actually join forces with the different powers that we have, the superpowers, right? <laughs> And of course, Kirsten and Tom are here in Chicago, and we were greatly fortunate to be able to, to rope them in to help us uh, perform this. And I was wondering what your experiences have been in joining in now. Well, it's so nice to be joined by our Los Angeles friends. And um, also, um, you know, I found out about Tempo because in the past year, we've started an organization in Chicago, as you know, the Eco Voice Project. Um, doing similar work, and so um, I'm familiar with other organizations that have that have popped up, and I, I'm I'm not surprised, and I won't be surprised when more organizations pop up around the country because I think people are are feeling the urgency, and I know for myself, um, having worked on climate projects with music for over ten or twelve years, I feel like I'm a product of this work. In a way, you know, having always been a lover of nature, a gardener, and my first project was an interdisciplinary project. I thought, oh, that's cool, science and music together. And after working on these projects over a number of years, I realized I was being transformed by the proximity and, and having to contemplate 
um, how to make this work for my students and, and elsewhere, um, that I have, I have changed myself through this work. And, um, and, and I, I feel like music has been not just a good tool for communicating, especially with vocal and choral music because of the community building, but also just a good friend. Because when you're really thinking about the data and what can I do today and, and feeling that immense responsibility for ourselves, our family, our community, the world, music is so both, you know, everything, but consoling and inspiring come to mind first. And um, it's, it's um, you know, I, I'm too, it's, it's too late for me to become a scientist. I'm, I'm a, mus a musician forever now. And so this work has allowed me personally to feel like um, uh, I can play a small role in, in at least communicating the urgency and some action points. So. Yeah, in response to what's happening today at this event, if you are a scientist, my recommendation for you is to be seriously open to the possibility of including an artist or a musician in every single meeting you have. And there is a reason for that. <laughs> music, of course, has the capacity to express yourself, but music as well has the cap capacity to transcend yourself. And transcendence is an essential space necessary for you to decide how to integrate whatever action you're intending to trigger. It's not enough to just trigger emotion for the sake of action. Action has to be embedded in wisdom. And wisdom can only create meeting, meaning if it's embedded in a transcendental space of awareness. And music has an incredible power to realize this space, especially in your meetings. <laughs> Speaking of the transformative power, I've been interested to compare how music functioned in the civil rights movement and how music functions in the climate movement. Bernice Johnson Reagan was one of the original freedom singers and she founded Sweet Honey in the Rock, a wonderful um, singing group. But she talks about that music had this defining role that she said the people were becoming new people that they had not been before. In the South, there were places they could not go, and their sound preceded them into the space. Even if it was like a segregated space, their sound preceded them. And th there's a traditional spiritual that she tells the story of, over my head, I see trouble in the air. Over my head, I see trouble in the air. But at the end of her first march, when she was a university student, she saw like a mile of people streaming across the bridge, participating in the, in the action with her, when she thought no one would have the guts to do it. And she said, I got to my meeting, they asked me to sing, and I didn't see trouble, I saw freedom. So she said, up over my head, I see freedom in the air. And she said, that's the first time I realized that this inheritance of the spirituals was for us now, and that we could transform with it and become new people. And so I'm very interested in the idea that we are becoming new people in our reverence for the earth and our fear for the fragility of it, and that by becoming new people, we act differently. And help some of us analytical scientists find other ways to act differently too. But, um, you know, this whole process has been right now we're seeing the the musician side of it and of course here at agu we've got the physical science of it but it's also the social science our you know our middle panel um i think is one of the critical aspects there is this whole field of people who study why people don't listen to us right and they've got really good solid data that show why people don't listen to us and what as, as Paul Slovic was saying there at the beginning, musicians offer us the opportunity to break through some of those barriers that people are facing to believing in climate action. You don't take action unless you believe you can make a difference, unless you believe that the action is worthwhile. 
and belief is more than knowledge. And I think that's, the, that's hard for us as scientists often to do because we create an emotional connection to data through data. I see that Keeling graph and I go, wow, I'm terrified, right? Most people don't get emotional reactions out of, out of data. And when we believe that that's the way people do it, we think we just need to give them more data. And that's been the hardest thing for me to give up. I don't just give them more data. I don't give them data in a new form. We've got to give them some other piece. And, and music is, is where I see a lot of this happening. Sorry, I keep on saying I'm not gonna talk, I'm the moderator, but that one I had to, to get in there. Um, is there, what more do we want to, um, uh, I've gotten the main ideas out here, but what else do you think you wanna say? Well, yeah, I, I, oh, is that you, Jonathan? <laughs> yeah, both um, um, if you just think about our cultural habits of separating agencies and disciplines, it is really necessary to create spaces in which this division separation, especially in the academy or in the sciences, is being challenged and questioned. Because um, once we bring aspects of the human experience together in one room, only then new possibilities um, emerge. Well, I've been really, and I may have even said this in my earlier comments, the concept of proximity just pops up when I'm writing or this. And, um, and for me, it's, it's been an important piece of this work. But I also like to think about, you know, and part of this project I've been working on is about music performance, the traditional, the, the traditional format where people come and sit in chairs and then people walk on stage and deliver some communication piece. Um, and I feel like it's, it's the perfect, you know, in addition to other modes of using music, the performance medium is, is such a perfect place to share information, especially information that, that affects people. Um, but I also think it's about the internal movement that happens with the musicians themselves. The people, and in a choir, of course, you're gathering people together, you're sharing breath, you're sharing a message, and, um, and I have this vision where as, as climate change just becomes a sort of a daily consciousness that we're all singing about it. And it, it's a far-fetched, you know, um, sense of imagination I have, but it, it's, such, it's such a crisis that you have to dream big. So if you think that everybody's gonna participate and it's gonna be so central to our lives, you know, and if we get 30% you know, there, that's fine too, in, in terms of how music can bring people together. And um, it's just about this daily proximity. Um, and I, I, I just have these big, big grand hopes that we're gonna be a part of that. Yeah, and we, we have begun, Tempo began as a project between the US and Japan. Uh, we are hoping to be able to take it uh, more globally. We have our, as you heard from Emiliano, we're getting a South, South American participation as well. And as we go forward, we're hoping to, to really go global because we're all gonna need to be part of it. Um, any, any last comments you want to make about the process? Yeah. Well, since you mentioned the US-Japan, it's been really interesting for me. I was born in Japan, I grew up in the States, uh, but I do consider myself to be bicultural, bilingual. And so with this temple project, because it was funded by US-Japan Foundation, I had to really think about the difference between the United States, or actually more West, more largely, um, and the Orient, um, Japan, um, and how we think of individuals and community and their relationships very differently. Uh, and we talked about this quite a bit in Tempo, uh, but also in the West, I feel that there is much more of a separation between the mind and the body, the understanding and the experience. You know? And then in Japan, there are spaces that are created 
to bring these things together. For example, in the tea ceremony or Buddhist meditations or things like this, you know? And I think, you know, for example, the concert format, it's highly ritualized. And yes, it's very Western, but you know, things like this can actually be utilized for us to bring the understanding and experience together as a community. Absolutely. And I think that the, the, the sort of communicative power of music, it, there are so many different kinds of music all around the world, but it is a, a set of, of communicative dialects, a set of communicative tools that can deepen connection like food, like if you think about other cultural connection, cross-cultural connection, music can fulfill that role as well. And I'll, I'll come back to just uh, hammer the, the point of the deepening of communication of a story you want to tell that can be added, that can be brought through the power of musical expression. Well, thank you. I think that uh, we have a little extra time so we can get the full okay. song in now. Good. Uh, go ahead and explain, yeah. Sean. So um, I, I've recently become acquainted with a wonderful young fellow named Luke Wallace, who is a Canadian eco-activist and songwriter. And he was on, literally on the front lines with old growth forest protection in British Columbia and spent months the most vivid detail he told me was that people were actually cementing their arms into the road to make them more of a blockade, you know, more of a nuisance to the police. And they did achieve in, in saving some things, but he has created a whole body of what I call like eco choruses or eco anthems. And we've arranged one of them uh, for uh, Kirsten's new earth ensemble to introduce to you. And this is movement music. So honestly, we want to help you learn it and sing it with us, and we hope that you can join in with us as we go for one of these songs. It's called Easy on the Earth. Well, Sons and Daughters, Easy on the Earth. You'll, you'll hear how it goes. Easy on the earth, lightly on the water. Remember this place is for your sons and daughters. Easy on the earth, lightly on the water. Remember who this place is for. Easy on the earth, easy on the earth, lightly on the water. Remember this place is for your sons and daughters. Lightly on the water, remember who this place is for. Get your kids to the garden, with the garden they'll grow, and they'll learn to go easy, they'll learn to live slow. Get your kids to the garden, in the garden they'll grow, and they'll learn to go easy, yeah. them how to battle, it'll teach them how to row. Get your kids to a river, with the river they'll flow, it'll take them where they need to go. Easy, easy, I'm going easy, I'm going easy, easy, I'm going easy. Let them see their reflections wherever they go In the rain, what a flood, what a sleet, hail, snow Let them see their reflections wherever they go Easy on the earth, lightly on the water Remember this place is for your sons and daughters Easy on the earth Lightly on the water, remember.
remember who this place is for. Easy on the easy, need me on the water. Remember this place is for your sons, your sons and daughters. Easy on the earth, lively on the water. Remember who this place is for. So thank you all, and thank you. Okay. Um, we're now getting towards the last piece of music that uh, Sean uh, composed for us. Uh, I'll let him say a bit about it in just a minute. But I did want to uh, remind you that we want to, uh, uh, we appreciate you guys doing the QR code. The other thing is that we want to grow tempo. You can come to our website at tempo-music.org if you want to be part of it, if you want to be connected with musicians as we grow uh, around the area. But um, I hope you've been able to enjoy this, and we will finish with music and let Sean talk about what he's thinking about as he put this together. Uh, my first couple of comments in the panel were about that elusive dream of can, can we create something that's viral, that's catchy? And you know, it's, it's very hard to force things in the arts because it's really inspiration based, but you can try, you can hope. Um, and, and also what you can do is kind of harvest what are the operative concepts or principles that are important. And this song is called Courage to Care because as we were thinking about what's, you know, Temple has been, we've made this point a lot, but just the idea that the, the statistics are grim, they're scary. They really are scary but we need to be moving forward in hope. So the whole idea that it takes courage to care when the odds are tough, um, at the midnight hour when you doubt your power. So I've, I've got page after page of lyric ideas. I work on 11 by 17 paper and just scratch a million ideas and rhyme words and what rhymes with that, what rhymes with that? Um, but anyway, this song is structured a little bit as call response with places where you can just repeat. So we really want to sing it for you, but we most want to sing it with you. So we, we do definitely invite you to please join in as, as, you, as you wish on some of the recurring patterns. So this is called Courage to Care. Do you want to say anything else, Kirsten? No, it's just I, I, can, I can say that uh, I have heard a lot of Sean's lyrics over the last couple of months, and it's been a pleasure to to kind of hear the piece develop. And we do hope that you'll join us on some of the, the repeating parts and they should be clear on the lyrics. So we look forward to singing Courage to Care with you.
Hopefully we got togetherness out of this and we'll get more songs and we'll change the world. Thank you all for coming.